extreme speed. From the X-1 that broke the sound barrier to the scramjet aiming for Mach 10. Planes on the cutting edge. From the past, the present, and the future. Now, extreme aircraft on modern marvels. Cloaked in secrecy, two American spy planes, the U-2 and the SR-71 Blackbird, made their mark on history during the Cold War. The U-2 was the first to become operational in 1956. Built originally for the CIA by the Lockheed Advanced Development Projects Group, better known as the Skunk Works, the U-2 could fly higher than any aircraft in existence at the time and provided crucial intelligence on Soviet military activities. When there was worry that the Soviet Union might be gathering a bomber fleet or might be gathering its forces for an attack on Western Europe or whatever else it might be up to, there was no way literally to penetrate this Iron Curtain, say fly over it. To operate at 70,000 feet and higher, the U-2's jet engine had to be virtually hand-built with much closer tolerances to reduce air pressure losses at high altitudes. Flying long transatlantic missions alone at night, navigating only by the stars with a sextant, the U-2 pilots collected intelligence that dramatically improved America's ability to assess the Soviet threat. The U-2 operations really gave rise to some remarkable images. There was imagery brought back that showed Soviet fighters trying to climb and catch it, stalling, spinning out of control, falling to Earth, other airplanes trying to do so-called pop-ups to get to altitude. Clearly, they knew we were there, but they were very frustrated at not being able to reach us with airplanes. The long, wide, straight wings of the U-2 gave the plane glider-like characteristics and it would soar so far above the ground that even if the Soviet military detected it, they couldn't reach it with fighters or missiles. Or so it was believed until May 1st, 1960. On that day, Francis Gary Powers was shot down by Soviet missiles as he took photos from 67,000 feet. After Powers successfully ejected, the Soviets put him on trial for espionage. The incident severely strained U.S.-Soviet relations. Powers was released two years later. Today, high altitude reconnaissance is done mainly by satellites, but an updated version of the U-2 has provided battlefield intelligence in Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq. It is also being used for high altitude research projects by NASA and other civilian agencies. We do Earth sciences. NASA has done it for 30 years or more. And that requires overflight over forest fires, over forests, desert, um, into the Arctic to check on the, uh, the ozone layer, which NASA first discovered. We fly a bigger variant of the U-2, but we have two of them, and we fly them worldwide on various missions of those kinds. As effective and enduring as the U-2 has been, it wasn't enough to meet America's reconnaissance needs at the height of the Cold War. Once again, the Lockheed Skunk Works, headed by the legendary Kelly Johnson, was tapped to come up with something better. And in 1962, they outdid themselves. The SR-71 Blackbird, a high-speed, high-altitude spy plane, is revered by many as one of the greatest jet planes ever built. The ethereal Blackbird could fly higher and faster than any jet aircraft in production. And that still holds today. I knew that this airplane was going to be the fastest in the world. What I didn't know was it would remain the fastest for 40 years. That's astonishing. But I remember back in the 60s, Kelly used to say, and he'd say it kind of aggressively, like I challenge anyone to adversely comment on this. He says, Nobody's going to produce an airplane with greater performance than this one by the year 2000. And back then I used to think, well, I hope I hang around long enough for the year 2000 to see if that turns out to be accurate, because before this came along, every two or three years somebody somewhere would produce one faster. As with the U-2, the initial client was the CIA, not the Air Force. 
the first version was called the A-12 and made its first flight in spring of 1962. To be able to withstand the heat generated by sustained speeds above Mach 3, the A-12 had to be designed from scratch with new technology and new materials. We would say this is roughly an 800 degree Fahrenheit airplane. Some things are hotter, but we have some cooler. I understand the self-cleaning oven is around uh, 425 and a soldering iron around 550. So that gives you an idea of what kind of heat we're talking here. The airframe was made from titanium and titanium alloys, and the structure was coated with a special radar-absorbing black paint that helped dissipate the heat. Because the aircraft surface was designed to expand from the heat during flight, the plane would leak fuel while sitting on the ground. The expansion would cause the entire aircraft to grow a couple of inches in length. This is the ejection sequence initiator, and you're flying along and the canopy is closed, and, uh, and you want to get out, so you pull this thing up. The first thing that happens is this canopy goes, and then up you go, and as you come out, you turn like this, and then you're dynamic this way, and you have deploy a stability chute, a small chute just for stability. And the G's may knock you out, but it won't be a death concern on that. And as you're coming down, you may still be unconscious, and, and then when you hit 15,000 feet, it cuts away that baby drogue chute for stability and deploys a large 35-foot chute. The aircraft was about 100 feet long and could carry 20 tons of special JP-7 jet fuel in the fuselage and wing tanks, enough to fly for about two hours. During this time, the high-flying spy plane could survey about 200,000 square miles of the Earth's surface. The CIA's highly classified single-seat A-12 version first flew in 1962, and the Air Force's twin-seat SR-71 version first flew in 1964. The two planes were nearly identical, and both could fly faster than Mach 3 at heights above 85,000 feet. The CIA continued to fly the A-12 until 1968, when the Air Force Blackbirds, based at Edwards Air Force Base, took over their reconnaissance duties. It wasn't only the fastest and highest flying airplane of its day, it also pioneered what today is called stealth, the ability to evade detection by radar. That airplane has these very you know, blended shapes and sharp chines, and it's got the tails folded in and so on. And uh, they you know, f did a, not much by calculation, but a large amount by intuition and by taking it out to a radar range, sort of the equivalent of a wind tunnel for radar, with models and trying different shapes and so on. And basically, by the time you saw the thing on radar going in Mach 3, it was gone. But now the Blackbird really is gone. The military mothballed the SR-71 fleet in 1990, claiming satellites could do the job better. Two of the Blackbirds were temporarily reactivated in 1995. Before there ever was an SR-71 Blackbird, another, even more futuristic-looking aircraft was being tested at Muroc. And this one was so far ahead of its time, it would have to wait decades before aviation technology caught up with it. In 1974, an SR-71 Blackbird flew from New York to London in a record 1 hour, 54 minutes and 56 seconds. Flying Wing says it all about the appearance of two of America's most futuristic-looking bombers. One from the past. And one from the present. Although separated by nearly half a century, they have exactly the same wingspan and were developed by the same company. The original Northrop Flying Wing bomber first flew in 1946. Its contemporary counterpart, the B-2, had its first flight in 1989 and will probably still be flying decades from now. Aircraft pioneer Jack Northrop was a champion of the flying wing design which eliminates the standard fuselage and tail found on most aircraft. Northrop, who was a consummate master of aircraft design, the most important designer of the interwar period in the United States, 
not just because of his flying wings, but because he's taking all the cutting edge developments in high speed aerodynamics and streamlining, and he's putting this together. Northrop felt the next logical step was the pure flying wing. This became almost an obsession with him. In 1941, Northrop was awarded a contract to develop and build the XB-35 flying wing bomber, capable of carrying a bomb load of over 52,000 pounds with a range of 7,500 miles. World War II was over by the time the XB-35 first took to the air in 1946, powered by four piston engines. The following year, the YB-49 flying wing with eight jet engines made its first flight. Air Force Major Robert Cardenas, the officer in charge of the X-1 project, was also chief test pilot for the YB-49 flying wing. Because of the plane's unconventional flight characteristics, Cardenas was nearly killed when he tried to put the flying wing into a stall during testing. When you start slowing down, there's one point at which the airflow over the wing ceases to create lift and you quit flying and it shudders and it shakes, that's a stall. But I was waiting for the shudder, and instead of that, it just gave kind of a lurch and it went over backwards and started tumbling backwards. So I reached up and I hit the left throttle full power on the left side. Even though it was tumbling, this side went up, tumbled it over into more of an inverted spin, and I could get out of that. Although Northrop insisted the flying wing couldn't possibly tumble, Bob Cardenas knew it could. And he warned his good friend, Glenn Edwards, another test pilot, about the problem. Cardenas was apparently proven right by a tragic accident in 1948 that killed Captain Edwards. Edwards was testing the flying wing when it crashed for unknown reasons, killing all five members of the crew. I think they were stall entry maneuvers, and maybe they entered it at a little higher speed than I did because on that first lurch where it goes over backwards, the load is on the wing like this, this kind of a load, and that's what broke off. The wings broke off outboard of those jet engines. The last thing Edwards wrote on his notepad indicates he may have put the airplane into a stall in spite of the advice he got from Bob Cardenas. One of the things that they had found was one knee pad uh, card which said stall entry maneuvers. The accident would change Muroc Air Force Base forever. It was renamed Edwards Air Force Base in honor of Cardenas's friend and fellow test pilot. In spite of severe problems with the aircraft, the YB-49 flying wing program continued and Cardenas was developing strong misgivings. I did not want them to buy the airplane. Nevertheless, in 1949, one of the planes set a new transcontinental speed record when Major Cardenas piloted a flying wing from Muroc to Andrews Air Force Base near Washington, D.C. in four hours and 20 minutes. President Truman was there and was favorably impressed. Truman came up in the cockpit and he looked around. And he, he was a pretty crusty old guy. He used a little more foul language than I'm going to say. He said it looked pretty damn good to him. He said he's going to buy some. I bit my tongue. Then down on the ground, he turned to the chief of the Air Force and he said, uh, why don't you have this young whippersnapper fly this down Pennsylvania Avenue? Rooftop level, I want people to see what I'm going to buy. So I did, I slowed down. I, I slowed down to about 300, 350 knots. But I had never really realized how heavily forested the city of Washington really is. It's a jungle. Well, while going down the avenue and losing the avenue amongst the trees, all of a sudden, I looked up and the Capitol Dome was straight ahead. So I had to pull up to go over it. And somebody on the steps took this picture as we were going over the top. The ill-fated trip back to Muroc would help bring the troubled flying wing project to an end. During the flight, six of the bomber's eight jet engines caught fire, forcing an emergency landing in Winslow, Arizona. Later that year, the Air Force's order for 30 flying wing bombers was canceled. But the Northrop Company wasn't finished with the flying wing idea. By 1981, aviation technology had changed dramatically, with electronic fly-by-wire controls making a flying wing design much more feasible. 
Fly-by-wire is basically computer controlled. There's no uh, hydraulic or uh, cable linkage to the, uh, the controls. The computer is monitoring uh, uh, what you want it to do and adjusts the flight controls in accordance with what, what you're asking the airplane to do. Northrop Grumman won a contract to build the Air Force a new bomber that would use Jack Northrop's flying wing concept. Apparently, Jack Northrop got the dimensions right the first time. The new flying wing, called the B-2, would have exactly the same 172-foot wingspan as the old flying wing. The build of that wing was a very, very challenging activity for us. Uh, the team overcame day in and day out. We used to call it an invention a day uh, to get us through the day. And uh, it's probably as an exciting a time as you'd ever uh, come across. It's a very highly integrated aircraft, very complicated, very complex. She's a very smart aircraft. Once she's all put together, you can't do anything to her you're not supposed to. She'll let you know. Jack Northrup, who was, was still very alert and very much interested in flight, had the chance shortly before he died to learn about the existence of the B-2 program. And he was very touched. And he said now he knew why God had let him live as long as he had. The B-2 stealth bomber was first revealed to the public in 1988 when it was rolled out of its hangar at the Air Force's Plant 42. To many, it signified that the flying wing design had finally become a successful bomber. To me, it was a vindication for Glenn's death. My work and his death were not in vain. We did accomplish uh, something. We didn't do it, but somebody accomplished the final act of making a system like that. The B-2's first flight came the following year with test pilot Bruce Hines at the controls. When Bruce Hines was going to fly it, they asked me to talk to him. I told him, I can't tell you anything. It's a different airplane. Just one thing, Bruce, don't stall the airplane. And so after he flew it, I said, Bruce, did you try stalling him? I said, Bob, the damn thing won't let you. It won't let you stall it. The first production B-2 was delivered to the Air Force in 1993. The 69-foot-long bombers are powered by four jet engines and carry two pilots. They're designed to carry 40,000 pounds of conventional or nuclear bombs and can fly at altitudes up to 50,000 feet. B-2s are subsonic, which means their top speed is just under the speed of sound. The fleet of 21 B-2s based at Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri first proved itself in combat in Kosovo, where B-2s destroyed more than 30% of Serbian targets in eight weeks by flying non-stop missions from Missouri to Kosovo and back. The B-2 is much more technically sophisticated than America's other long-range bombers, the B-52 and the B-1. The B-1 as well as the B-52 are not stealthy platforms. Only the B-2 bomber can penetrate heavily defended airspace fly for thousands of miles undetected, carrying a huge load of weapons, deliver those weapons precisely, and get out of that area without being detected. Jack Northrop would be more than proud, and pr proud of the people every bit as much as he's proud of, of what the people have done with the technology, and certainly uh, some of the very basic uh, vision that he had uh, years and years ago. With the B-2, the U.S. Air Force unquestionably has the most modern bomber in the skies. Now, they need a fighter to match. Enter the F-A-22 Raptor. In Operation Enduring Freedom, the B-2 flew a 44-hour mission with mid-air refueling from Missouri to Afghanistan to an airbase at Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. The McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle first flew in 1972. reigned unchallenged for decades as the world's premier air superiority fighter. But the new F-A-22 Raptor will finally bring that reign to an end. Both the F-15 and the Raptor fly and climb faster than conventional jet fighters. This enables them to dominate air-to-air -air battles with enemy planes which means they can deny the skies to the enemy. Hence the term, air superiority fighter. 
The goal in developing a fighter airplane is really to make certain that you can totally overwhelmingly dominate the opponent. If you look at the F-15, it became America's most successful air combat fighter. Indeed, you can argue historically it's the most successful air combat fighter of all time because it has never been shot down in air-to-air -air combat while shooting down close to 200 opponents in air-to-air -air combat. In 1975, 20 F-15 Eagles were modified to make them even faster. Called Streak Eagles, they set several time-to-climb records that still stand. But the new F-A-22 Raptor is expected to break those records and bring new meaning to the term air superiority. The F-15 is very old in the tooth. You know, if we take a look at our fighter forces today, you realize that if these airplanes were automobiles, they'd be wearing classic car plates. After a testing and validation program lasting four and a half years, the industry team of Lockheed Martin and Boeing in 1991 won the competition to build the next generation air superiority fighter that would replace the aging fleet of F-15s. It capitalizes on a number of technological revolutions, and this enables us to get first look at an opponent, first shot at that opponent, and first kill, where we are literally moving out of the fight before the enemy realizes they're being attacked. You can detect him, you can fire a missile on him, and he'll almost blow up before he even knows you're there. So it's not that you're undetectable, but by the time he does detect you, you already have such an offensive advantage on him that uh, it's, you know, it's really not even a competition. The production version of the F-22 design, now called the Raptor, first flew in 1997. Like the F-15 Eagle, it can fly at Mach 2.5. But the Raptor can do it without using afterburners, making it harder for an enemy to detect. The F-A-22 is also easier to fly. An Air Force pilot who was training to fly the F-A-22 told a bunch of reporters recently on the trip that I took that traditionally a pilot had to spend about 85-90% of his or her brain power just to attain a situational awareness, just to take the information from each of his sensors and understand what they were telling.